Um, my name is Dr. Jamie Sweden. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist working at Waitamata District Health Board. Prior to that, I was a pediatrician. I did my training in um, Waikato um, and a few years in Starship, and then jump ship and did um, child psychiatry as well. So I was given the task of covering childhood ADHD assessment, um, copmia, which is a huge talk on itself. So copmia is uh, children of parents with mental illness. Um, so I've relabeled that as managing parents because most of the time, practically, the parents often have more ADHD symptoms than the children. <laughs> uh, and when it comes to losing scripts, it's a bit of an issue. Um, and stimulant monitoring, and that's something um, I think we all struggle with and how often we should be doing our bits and pieces. I guess I think the, the easiest thing to start with is ADHD, um, yes, it comes up with a lot of behavioral symptoms, but it is a biological neurodevelopmental entity. Um, recently, there was a very good study earlier this year that did um, a good look at all the studies around fMRIs, um, PET scans, and everything else, showing there actually is a uh, delay in development in the thickness of the frontal cortical cerebral cortices, um, as well as the subcortical um, differences, especially in a lot of the basal ganglia. So a lot of that comes down to the amygdala and the limbic system, which, as we know, is related to emotional dysregulation and emotional control, not just attention, behavior, and concentration. Um, what I often say to the parents and the young people with ADHD is, look, your brain's wired differently. You get the best of both worlds. You get a lot of creativity, but unfortunately, having to sit still and get stuck in a classroom is not one of your strengths. What we do know, though, is you will eventually catch up with the rest of your classmates. Unfortunately, it's usually around sort of 17, 18, 19, just when you're trying to finish high school. Um, and this is quite a nice way to show them, look, um, as you can see the top slide, that's the ADHD thickness of the cortices, and it's quite delayed, and they finally catch up around 13. For those as significant ones, as it turns up a lot later. Another couple of pictures. Um, the other one that just came out, um, published in one of the news websites, so I went back and pulled the paper, is a small study, unfortunately it was only about, I think, 27 or 28 people um, looking at ADHD in adults and doing functional MRI scans. Um, as you can see with the one on the left, they've got all the right areas of communicating lighting up with no ADHD. Those with active ADHD, the limbic system, the basal ganglia um, areas, they're not communicating, they're not lighting up, so you can't see much in the, in the back of the, of the ventricles. With those adults in remission, they get the best of both worlds. They're getting a lot of communication across all the pathways and it's lighting up. Yep, it's just another way for me to show the teenagers and the kids, look, I've got some fancy pictures to tell you how your brain works differently. There's also been some recent changes in the DSM, um, from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Practically, it doesn't make too much difference, but it does make life a bit easier. So the main issue is the age of onset has got changed from being less than 7 to less than 12. I think with education and better scaffolding in the classroom system, we are seeing some of these kids later, um, because they've been um, supported a lot better in the early childhood through um, education. The other thing is, as well, um, we only need five of nine symptoms um, in adolescents and adults, knowing as you get older, you tend to grow out a lot of that um, hyperactive uh, part of ADHD. The last one, which I haven't circled because it's going to be a bit of a messy slide, when you get down to impairment, the DSM-4 had to be clinically significant. They've reworded it to say it's an interference with functioning or development, and they've specified for mild, moderate, or severe functional impairments. With the older teenagers who actually have quite good IQs and are quite bright, their functional impairment only kicks in when they're trying to juggle all the NCA exams, so often only turns around exams. You do the screening and you realize they've been struggling with ADHD for quite a while, but because they haven't been failing, because they're actually quite intelligent, their drop in function is going from being the top of the class to being the middle of the class. Put them on some medication with some environmental changes and all of a sudden they're back at the top of the class. That's quite a big difference. I don't think we should be saying one of the things I need to say to get your ADHD is you have to fail. Failing sometimes is just passing for some of these kids. One of the ones I've been seeing recently has an IQ of 150. Um, but he was starting to fail. It's like, well, that shouldn't have happened. We know you've got a high IQ. What is the local prevalence? This seems to have sneaked up um, ever since I did my training um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, the pediatrics. Um, but 
I think the best way this comes from, there's a couple of review articles, one's the Lance in the New England Journal, around sort of 3.4. Um, the Europeans with their ICD-10, they have a lesser um, rate because hyperkinetic disorder has a different uh, symptom profile. We tend to see three to four more boys than girls, um, but in a clinic it tends to be more eight to one. Um, and there seems to be some difference across lower in income and higher income countries, um, but I'm not going to go into that because that's a, a can of worms. Environmentally, we know the, the prem babies also have an increased risk, two to three times, um, and low APGAR scores may also um, give you an increased risk. It's not huge, um, but it's something you just need to be aware of. Um, we also know cigarette smoking, fetal alcohol, 85 to 95% of kids with fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which is now being labeled, have ADHD. Practically, again, there's number of my other pet topics. Because we can't diagnose fetal alcohol in the public system in some areas of New Zealand, often the one thing we can do is, is diagnose the ADHD because that might be the one thing that might make a difference for keeping them in class and school without being kicked out. Um, illicit substances, and there was that study that also said paracetamol may be leading to um, increased rates of ADHD. Um, but um, not nutritional deficiencies, uh, especially um, polyunsaturated um, fatty acids, the omegas, um, or food colouring from surpluses in pregnancy. I've seen a few kids have had encephalitis with ADHD, post-encephalitis and meningitis, um, and also the Romanian study from Rutter around early deprivation adversity. So that was quite a good study to say, look, actually early adversity, if it's really severe, can actually cause your brain to miswire itself so you present with symptoms that symptomatically and clinically look like ADHD. So that's the study they took from all the Russian orphans and the 1980s have followed them through, they're in the early 20s now. Um, with support and foster care, it's got a great chart, it's about to be published. Um, the picture I took from this, um, the talk at the Congress was pretty terrible. Um, but the IQ actually normalized over time, yet their ADHD symptoms persisted. Um, so there was quite clear there's something going on at a, at a, a neurological and, um, and a brain level. One thing, though, that is really interesting to remember is, look, early ADHD symptoms can lead to negative mother-child relationships, um, which does respond to treatment, um, if you can work on that. So often we, the buzzword for us at the moment, and I'll try not to stick my foot in, is attachment disorders. Um, yes, they're a real thing, but actually sometimes if you've got a kid and a child who has rip ADHD, they are hard to parent. Um, you've got to up your game and learn some difficult skills and, and realize how to manage um, the ADHD could uh, slightly better and a bit more clever because they do tend to run rings around you. <coughs> the other thing that comes through from the biological studies is yes, there's attention deficit, hyperactivity, impulsivity disorder. There's also executive function issues and that probably will turn up in the next DSM. We've now got the studies where the ones I showed you from the brain study showing those are the areas that actually struggle on, on scans. So I've just put this for completeness because they're the ones that I find the kids, as they get older, struggle more and more around response inhibition, which we can test, but it's a working memory. They're always forgetting things. I just talked to a kid the other day and he says, right, so you catch the bus to school. How many bus cards have you lost this year? Five. Um, what's it like getting up in the morning? Do you always forget to take the stuff to school? He said, I just learned to keep the, everything in my bag so I don't forget it because I get into so much trouble. That's the executive function part of ADHD. Unfortunately, it's the part that doesn't respond to older medication completely, but you can get some benefits. So I was asked to talk a bit about the assessment, and again, this is different across a lot of the DHBs. Most of the time, it's a pediatric uh, diagnosis. Where I work, we have joint clinics between child psychiatry and pediatrics. Um, outside of Auckland, we have child development centers where I trained. In Auckland, we don't, um, so it all goes through general pediatrics or, or hand in hand. To make a diagnosis, it's, it's really just getting a school report and doing the CONUS um, questionnaires done. Um, for the younger children, it's from parents and teachers, usually one parent and one teacher, occasionally two. Um, for the older um, children and adolescents, I also get to do a self one as well. Um, then, of course, we have the um, clinic assessment. Um, and if need be, there are some extra things we can do as well. 
Um, in the public system, we don't do cognitive um, testing. In the private system, where I've got a clinic with a whole bunch of um, psychologists, um, we do. It's really interesting to see what on the WISC and the cognitive assessment their working memory and processing speeds are, because that's the one that causes problems in the classroom. They can listen, but they can't process, they can't hold the information. Can we work on some of those skills? Um, and also some of the executive function stuff, we can do some psychometric testing like a brief um, that also shows us and quantifies how much they're struggling with the executive function, because that's not screened that well in the Connors. The other thing is ADHD lookalikes. <coughs> um, before I make a diagnosis, I'm also screening as a you for what other things this could be. Anxiety disorders, autistic spectrum disorders look like ADHD. Often you can have them comorbidly together. Um, the one I always go through first is sleep disorders. Um, a number of kids, the younger kids not so much because hopefully mum and dad are onto it, the older kids with their screen times, their phones and things are sleep deprived. They haven't got a good bedtime routine, they're sneaking things into the room, they're grumpy, they're not paying attention, the grades are slipping. Um, they'll be lippy, they'll be acting out, they'll be oppositional, and it looks like ADHD. Often I get their sleep sorted first and a lot of those symptoms dissipate. Um, so often I'm using a lot more sleep routine, sleep hygiene, and even melatonin. Um, although the funding means you've got to have a diagnosis of ADHD, but if you can get away with a couple of weeks of unfunded melatonin, that's fine. Often we do have the kids with um, the abusive and, and violent background, so we always think about, look, are they, how are they exhibiting these symptoms because home's just not safe for them, um, and we need to keep an eye out for that, whether it's domestic violence or um, physical and sexual abuse. And of course the other one um, with my background is specific learning disabilities, intellectual disability. Often we get kids who turn up we had one the other day, a foster kid and his caregivers turned up. I referred through by Oranga Tamariki. Um, he has a clear-cut anxiety disorder. Talking to me, we realized, no, he doesn't have an anxiety disorder. He's just not that bright. And actually, most anxiety is because he goes to school and he knows he can't do much um, at year nine. Um, we snuck a, a little cognitive assessment through, and sure enough, his whisk came back at 68, so he's got a clear-cut intellectual disability. Um, so treatment um, is a bit different between Australasia, Europe and the States. Thankfully the whole diagnosis of pediatric bipolar disorder has had a bit of decline. Um, the, the guy who um, wrote those studies was heavily funded by the drug companies. Um, heavily funded. like millions of dollars. Um, and a lot of the time we see, yes, kids will be kids. They should be busy. They should be having fun. Sometimes they'll push the boundaries. It doesn't mean they've got pediatric bipolar disorder, ADHD. Um, sometimes they're just being kids. Um, and they definitely don't need lithium or being medicated for it. Um, so the first line for, for us is medication in conjunction with behavioural interventions. So we try the behavioural interventions first, unless the school's about to expel them and they're only seven. Then we're like, right, let's do behaviour and medication. Um, it's not good to have an expulsion on your record before you've even left primary school. So we can optimise the classroom management strategies. Um, sometimes it's about having a quiet zone to walk out to if you're getting overwhelmed. Other times having um, movement breaks. Um, a lot of teachers do it for most of the kids in the class anyway. Um, we, in, in Maranoto West, um, we run parental psychoeducation groups um, to get the parents up to speed around what is ADHD and what they can do at home to support what the school's doing and what they can do at home. One of the things we know from the MTA study um, back in 99 was intensive behavioural treatment and medication worked, but actually when it came down to it, um, medication was just as good for the core features of ADHD, which is great for doctors because it's easier to prescribe than do 12 to 18 weeks of behavioural management therapy. No, I don't want to end the talk. Um, but we do know that the combined behavioural treatments and medications actually do have better um, effects for associated symptoms, level of functioning, and we may get away with lower drug doses. 
Um, the other thing is when you think about executive function issues, they don't respond that well to medication. So that's where you've got to do some behavioral stuff in there as well. I've popped these in there. I'm not going to go through them. Um, I went to the ADHD Congress in Vancouver earlier this year, and the Canadians are doing it really well. So they've got a whole lot of resources on their website. This is one of them, um, psychoeducation and what you can cover. You're going to get all these slides anyway. Um, but CADRA is, um, I'll get it wrong, Canadian ADHD resource or something. Anyway, CADRA. Um, but they also have psychosocial interventions for at home, at school, at work relationships. This is gold. This is really good, and it's on a page. Um, right. These days, uh, non-medications is a big, big discussion point. Um, so the studies, and I've got a couple of forest plots, there seems to be a relationship between some food colours and some kids. Parents tend to work this out for themselves. The study themselves um, are a bit of a hit and miss because they used a whole lot of food colourings that actually aren't in our diet. Um, so we have to take it with a grain of salt. But you always come across a su small subset of kids who do respond to red and green food colourings. Often it's because the parents themselves know they themselves have to avoid it because they get quite stupid and silly themselves. Um, slightly almost diagnostic at times. Um, one thing that has come through is omega-3 fatty acids, and the dosages depend on the study. So I've just, most of them seem to be sort of 500 milligrams plus a day. There seems to be a modest improvement, probably at least about 25% of a medication effect. Um, the difficulty is, they're not cheap. If you can get a script for $5 a month compared to $50, $60 worth of fish oils, sometimes if the family can't afford it, it's easy to use stimulants. Um, the other one is micronutrients. Um, there seems to be a possible benefit in adults with the, um, a, the study that came out for Christchurch, and they've just published the child um, study as well. Um, the study seems to work best for um, inattentive symptoms, and that's the study that just got published. So 93 children, 10 weeks of micronutrients. The problem is um, a bottle of the capsules cost you almost $200 a month. And they send you a letter as a prescribing pediatrician psychiatrist to say, can we wean them off all the medications to try it clean? Which is fine, but again, if I'd rather you save $195 a month and put them into sports teams, something else, pro-social stuff, than put them onto um, a nutrient that does work for some of the symptoms, but not all of them. Um, but it's around what is right um, when it comes to consent and giving them all the options. It doesn't work well for hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms looking at the study. Um, and the other thing is, yes, it was clinical improvement in 47% of them, but 28% in the placebo group also had an improvement as well. This is the forest plot. And can I get the pointer to work? Yeah. Um, one of the things that came through from a lot of the non-medication studies is if you ask the people closest to them, it looks like you get a lot more benefit. As soon as you blind it, you lose most of the effect. And that's been the problem. We haven't had quite good blinder studies that shown the effect we thought we wanted. Um, the only thing that seems to come through is the omega-3s and maybe the nutrition um, supplements that have just come through from Christchurch. Medications, methylphenidate, all the different types of Ritalin. Um, we start with roughly half a milligram per kilo, roughly, and slowly work up the dose depending. Some kids are more sensitive, some kids need a lot higher dose. Um, fetal alcohol uh, kids, again, either need a tiny homeopathic dose or a really big dose. Um, atomoxidine is a non-stimulant. Um, I do tend to use it every now and then, mainly for the teenagers. Um, and dexamphetamine, but it tends to cause quite a lot of um, anxiety symptoms. I'll just skip through these because I want to talk about the cardiac stuff because that's the one thing that's changed over time. Um, I always do the assessment, heart rate, blood pressure, heart rate. Every now and then I do an ECG. I don't routinely screen with an ECG anymore like we used to with the MTA study because it looks like this is one of the safest medications out there. It does not cause any problems when it comes to cardiac stuff. Um, how often should we be screening? 
Um, so I, it's great, they come to me, do the assessments, start them, stabilize them, and then I refer them and discharge them back to you. Um, it'd be good to get a height done every six months, and the weight every three to six months with a dose change, and then six monthly is fine. Um, I do blood um, pressure centiles at initiation, then at three months, and that's it. Because all I'm looking for is a, um, is a background hypertensive, undiagnosed hypertensive issue, um, because stimulants don't put your blood pressure up. You're only going to have problems if you're already at the top of the um, normal curve. There's lots of papers now that have just come out, um, and there's some down the bottom saying it's not associated with QT changes, it's not associated with cardiac death, it's not associated with acute myocardial and functional stroke. It can cause arrhythmias if you've got scrambled at cardiac anatomy. Chances are they're going to have arrhythmias anyway, whether it's an Epstein or something else, um, because you've got arrhythmia problems sitting in the background. The last Cochrane review had no evidence of increase in serious adverse effects. It did have an increase in non-serious adverse effect, events, but when you dig into it, they were just sleep and appetite issues, and they're the commonest ones. So we know when you take a stimulant, often your appetite drops around lunchtime. If you're taking one of the long-acting ones for 10 to 12 hours, it can sometimes bump into your um, nighttime sleep routine. But again, teenagers, it's hard to know what's caused by the phone and what's caused by the stimulants. Just to, to go, the other thing is don't freak out if you have teenagers turning up on high doses. Um, Consurator, the maximum dose of Consurator is 54 milligram in a tablet, but if we're using one milligram per kilo dose, there's not many adult sized teenagers running around at 54 kilos. So often I'll add in another Consurator on top of that. And the NICE guidelines, they actually can go up to two milligrams per kilo. Um, so every now and then with the kids we're really struggling with, often they've got an intellectual disability or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we can push the dose up. And just to wrap up, parental ADHD. ADHD is really, really genetically um, strongly linked. Um, I've skipped out all the slides. It's linked in clusters of genes. Um, somewhere between 700 to 2,000 genes in clusters, there's a crossover with autistic spectrum disorders, there's a crossover with schizophrenia. Um, they're still trying to figure it out. So there's no one gene that we can blame, but we do know it comes through the family tree. Um, so with the children we see, at least a third to a quarter of the parents have ADHD themselves. Um, Often it tends to make you realize that the kids themselves have more significant ADHD than you realize, often because there's other stuff going on at home. Um, unfortunately, I had one, thank was just the mum came in, and I said, any family history? She said, well, yes, now you've mentioned it, that might be why dad left school, early got kicked out, went on a big bender, did lots of drugs, finally came back, did his exams, and ended up um, in a top level um, university in north of England. And I said, well, it sort of seems a little bit suspicious. <laughs> I had another dad who sat there in front of me, and as I described what ADHD is and all the executive dysfunction and, and forgetting and needing lists of things and how we work around that and starting task and finishing task, and dad just sat there and just looked at me gobsmacked and just went, oh. <laughs> and the wife turned to him and said, we're going to have a lot to talk about in the car ride home. <laughs> So parents often do recognize themselves in their children. The other thing is, although it's moving a little bit out of the developmental um, spectrum, ADHD often turns up with a lot of other things. So just because you've got ADHD, don't forget, they may have a whole lot of other stuff. And so for adults, there is a lot of comorbidity with all of these things. And sometimes, um, especially with the older children, the teenagers, we may need to do a lot of work on the anxiety because putting them stimulants might actually make them a little bit more anxious. So we try and deal with anxiety first, whether it's a CBT, CBT or skills, or occasionally add in some SSRIs before I add in the stimulant. Cool.